Imagine a minuscule island nation, tinier than New York City, yet somehow managing to be the wealthiest in Asia and among the richest globally. This place, Singapore, boasts a GDP per capita that has astonishingly surpassed economic giants like the UK, the US, and France. Over a span of just six decades, Singapore morphed from a colonial trading port into a bustling financial hub that the entire world gazes at with envy. It's held up as a shining example for any nation aspiring to cultivate a robust, high-tech economy. This affluence didn't just fall from the sky. It's the result of meticulous planning by a political party that's clung to power since independence. So, what's the secret sauce behind Singapore's dazzling success story? As the nation undergoes its first leadership shuffle in two decades, the burning question is, can it keep riding the prosperity wave? When Singapore took its first breath of independence back in 1965, the inaugural Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew and his band of visionary founders saw a glaring economic conundrum staring them in the face. They had zilch in terms of natural resources. Nada. If they dreamed of crafting an economy driven by exports and wooing foreign investment, they had no choice but to bolster the manufacturing sector. Singapore's strategic location was its ace in the hole. With a prime spot granting access to the Straits of Malacca, the Indian Ocean, and the South China Sea, it positioned itself as a crucial shipping nexus. So initially, Singapore morphed into a manufacturing hub, laser-focused on labor-intensive industries to obliterate the rampant unemployment. But let's not kid ourselves. Lee Kuan Yew only saw manufacturing as a mere stepping stone toward a more sophisticated economy. He meticulously crafted the bedrock of a solid financial and legal framework, coupled with a stable, mostly corruption-free government. Meanwhile, he ensured that public transport was efficient and the healthcare infrastructure was world-class. Fast forward to the 1980s. Lee began setting the stage for what has now become Singapore's most lucrative cash cow, finance. Taking a page from the playbooks of the U.S. and U.K., he decided to give the financial services industry a makeover with a sprinkle of laissez-faire regulation. The result? Well, just take a look around. A whopping 4,200 multinational corporations have chosen this place as their regional HQ. Isn't that something? Low taxes are like the irresistible siren call for these companies. Singapore's corporate tax rate stands at a mere 17%, and for some activities, it can plummet to an eye-popping 13.5% or even lower. Why, you ask? Because Lee's successor, Go Chok Tong, kept the momentum going, rolling out the red carpet for big business. Singapore pivoted, with a flourish, toward a knowledge-based economy, leaning heavily on creativity and nurturing its homegrown entrepreneurs. Back in 2004, Li Xianlong, the illustrious offspring of Li Kuan Yew, ascended to the premiership throne. He had an epiphany. To keep the cash and businesses flowing like a river, Singapore had to transform into an even more alluring place to call home. Not one, not two, but three. With its prime geographical location, Singapore had to morph into a destination in its own right. This has been the secret sauce to Singapore's triumph. In the 1970s, Singapore embarked on a daring land reclamation escapade. Over the decades, that newly minted space was crammed with not just soulless offices and cookie-cutter apartment buildings, but also with entertainment meccas, radically altering the city skyline in the process. A shining example of this was the introduction of the F1 night race, a spectacle that made the city roar with excitement. Oh, isn't it just delightful how the Singaporean government rolled out the red carpet for casinos, or as they fancifully call them, integrated resorts. The timing was absolutely spot on, coinciding with the economic explosions in China and India. Singapore found itself perfectly poised, right in the sweet spot, to reel in the region's ultra-wealthy. 
These high rollers could indulge in the casino's glitz and glamour, savor the nightlife, and conveniently stash their cash away. The outcome? A jaw-dropping leap in the total value of assets under management, skyrocketing from a mere U.S. $420 billion at the dawn of Lee Sien Lung's leadership to a staggering U.S. $3.6 trillion by 2022. Yet, while Singapore flaunts its economic triumphs, there's a murmur of discontent in the background. Some folks aren't exactly thrilled with the leadership's approach, whispering about those pesky restrictions on civil liberties and media freedom. But hey, who needs freedom when you've got a booming economy, right? Ah, the legendary freedom of the press in Singapore, where journalism is as free as a bird in a cage. The news media, that noble institution, must obediently bow down to the almighty integrity of Singapore, whatever that means. Under the reign of Lee Kuan Yew, critics were quick to point out the suffocating atmosphere of fear that permeated the nation. People whispered in hushed tones, terrified of uttering a single word against the almighty government. Fast forward to today, and surprise, surprise, subsequent administrations have been slammed for keeping an iron grip on the populace. Protests, those pesky displays of public opinion, remain largely forbidden. Yet, the government, in its infinite wisdom, is acutely aware that its citizens are evolving. They are becoming a colorful tapestry of diversity, more outspoken than ever before. Meanwhile, Singapore must keep its edge sharp, as other nations take notes from its growth playbook, and climate change looms ominously as a threat to national security. Enter Lawrence Wong, stepping into the spotlight as Singapore's new prime minister, inheriting this complex, multifaceted nation. Good luck, Mr. Wong. You'll need it. Wong, a product of public housing, has been lauded for his deft handling of the nation's COVID-19 crisis. His connection with the everyday citizen is often highlighted as a defining trait. There's talk of leveraging current successes. Why not bolster and double down on what's already thriving in Singapore? Meanwhile, the People's Action Party clings to power though its charm seems to be fading faster than a politician's promise. Expect the political arena to become a circus of drama and intrigue, more so than in any previous era. The accumulation of wealth, of course, hasn't been without its own delightful set of headaches. Housing prices have skyrocketed, while the cost of living has spiraled upwards. It's as if Singapore's growth strategy involves luring foreign labor like moths to a flame, Yet citizens fret that these outsiders are snatching all the prime jobs. Sure, if you squint at the statistics, inequality appears to have shrunk. But that's not exactly the sentiment echoed by the locals. With the nation's population aging faster than a banana left in the sun, the pressure on workforce expansion and government coffers is bound to intensify. So, whether it's about quelling dissatisfaction or steering Singapore's transformation into a tech powerhouse, Wong's task is nothing short of maintaining the city-state's meticulously crafted success.